Thanks everybody for joining us. So welcome to Jessica Bright from Bryn Mawr College, uh, Elizabeth Jones Minziger from Haverford College, and Emily Higgs Copen from Swarthmore College, the Tri Colleges. They're gonna do a presentation and I think a demo of their oral histories um, on their Islandora site. And I will now turn it over to them. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. I think you should all be able to see my screen now. Is that correct? Yep, yep. Okay. we can see it. Um, so today we wanna show you our site and a little bit about how we've used kind of oral histories uh, that Born Digital, our vendor partner, has developed uh, a way for us to kind of use oral histories in the same way we were used to in Islandora 7. So a little bit more about who we are. Um, my name is Emily Hayes Copen. I am the head of digital collection strategy for Swarthmore College. Um, I will let the other two presenters introduce themselves as they chime in. Um, but basically all three of our institutions are in the suburbs of Philadelphia and we share network systems as uh, our ILS, Islandora digital storage space. We share a lot of stuff. So um, we don't uh, we have an Islandora site that was built for us by Born Digital that uh, we all three institutions share. We have been in this state of migration for feels like my entire life. So in 2021, we finished a migration project from Content DM. Um, we, we were using a very old version of Content DM for our digitized archival collections that we moved into Islandora 7. And then Pretty much right away, we uh, migrated our Islandora 7 site to Islandora 2.0. And um, in the new year, we are going to migrate a lot of our uh, born digital and audiovisual content off of some other systems, um, including DSpace, into Islandora 2.0. And our uh, vendor partner for these migrations has been Born Digital, um, which we have enjoyed a very fruitful relationship with Born Digital. And if that was not true, I probably wouldn't say that in this group, but it is true. So um, compliments to Born Digital. So when we were um, kind of in the discovery phase of this second migration project from Islandora Legacy to Islandora 2.0, as many projects start, we came up with a list of functional requirements. And our collections managers um, and stakeholders kind of in archives and special collections at the three colleges really attached to this, um, the oral history solution pack in uh, Islandora Legacy. We really liked the side-by-side -side kind of metadata and transcripts, the ability to have time transcripts as well as full text transcripts um, and different file types for those transcripts. And that was something that was really important for us and was a required functional requirement um, going into this migration project and the build that Born Digital did for us. So also was worth the custom development for us because we have very strong accessibility forward policies at the TRICO. Um, we have accessibility officers and ITS who um, are very unhappy with anything that doesn't have a, have a transcript for AV materials especially. So we really kind of wanted this to be as close as possible to Islandora Legacy. So that was um, given to Born Digital as a custom development task for us um, during the migration. And I think we have a bunch of slides that kind of show you how this look. We can do a live demo as well, but um, didn't want to, <laughs> I just I just got an email actually that they're doing some server maintenance later today. So um, didn't want to completely depend on a live demo, but um, I think I'm going to pass it over to Jessica now to show some of the oral histories and how that has worked in the Bryn Mawr side of things. Thanks, Emily. Can everyone hear me okay? I hope. Perfect. Uh, I'm Jessica Bright. As Emily mentioned, I'm the digital collections and metadata librarian at Bryn Mawr uh, College, and uh, I'm going to be speaking today kind of more on what we have in our oral histories, what we ingest, and sort of what it looks like for the end user online. So you'll see here, uh, I included a screenshot of our overall oral histories collection page, which really consists of all of the different oral histories that we have on Islandora shared into one discovery touch point of this collection. So to help sort of set the scene for what we have, we have a growing collection of legacy and current oral histories, all of which are audio files. By policy, we don't collect video oral histories. 
So this really allows us to be strategic about file size and storage because as we all know, audio is significantly smaller than video and it's also easier to troubleshoot <laughs> in some ways. So the legacy oral histories are primarily on cassette tapes. So using our inventory, we're going through and prioritizing tapes for digitization and ingest Islandora. As Emily mentioned, uh, accessibility is really important. So for any new content that we ingest, we're making sure that there's transcripts available. Some cassette tapes had accompanying type transcripts that we can OCR or Islandora can OCR and have available as extracted text. But many of these legacy oral histories don't. So we use speech to text transcription tools to make this a lot easier and less human dependent. We use Temi, which is a web-based tool that basically just lets us upload an audio file and the service uses uh, speech recognition to generate a transcript that we can then finesse to fix any mistaken words or phrases and, you know, fix it up to our parameters. For our more current oral histories, these are centered on student-led projects, which you'll see examples in the following screenshots. Students conduct all of the work for these oral history projects, including generating the preservation level oral history files, gathering all of the necessary consent and release forms, creating the transcripts, and also getting interviewees to sign off on the transcripts. So this makes our part a lot more straightforward because we just need to create the metadata and ingest the oral histories. These projects are advised by our college archivist, so we know how many interviews there will be, when they're going to be transferred to special collections, and can make sure we have everything signed off on so that we can make them actually accessible online on Islandora. So now that you have uh, some of that background knowledge of what our oral histories are and um, all the necessary pieces, this is what it looks like in Islandora. So this is the view from an individual oral history item page. You'll see this one is a compound object. I, I like this project. I, I thought it was interesting. The um, interviewer asked all of the interviewees for childhood photos. And so it gives a nice bit of personalization to the to the oral histories. Um, so you'll see there's two children items in this compound object. And it's a little bit of a long scroll. So you'll see the top is on the left. And then I had to make a second screenshot and that's on the right. So starting on the left, you see the two child item thumbnails at the top, the interview itself and the, the photo, the childhood photo. Um, below that's the audio player, and then below that are the different views that show the timestamp synchronized transcript, the item metadata, the set metadata for the overall compound object, and then the transcript text file. So sometimes we have multi-part oral histories that really necessitate the compound object, and sometimes it's just the audio file and uh, any accompanying transcripts and thumbnails. So that's basically what we ingest for most of our oral histories is the audio files, the transcripts, and a thumbnail to represent the files. So this is a more um, basic view. This is just a standalone audio mo uh, model. It just has the one, one audio file. There's no um, need for the compound object panel, so it's just the player, the metadata, and the transcripts below. So speaking of transcripts, so this is some of the, an example of the customizations that Born Digital did to allow different types of transcripts. So you've got the basic sort of standard text file transcript on the right, but there's also a capability for timestamp synchronized transcript files like XML and VTT files. So having files like this that can synchronize the audio and transcripts is really helpful. It makes the interview more accessible and it also allows people to move through the interviews more quickly and directly and get to the point that they want. I've heard a lot of user feedback from our community and people are very excited to have this feature. So most of the oral history projects that come into special collections already have the timestamp synchronized files. So this makes the ingest process a lot smoother. Sometimes the interviewer also even has a Word doc or text file copy of the transcript already prepared. So that makes it even that much easier because we don't have to kind of finesse it ourselves. One of the other customizations that uh, Born Digital has helped us with and that we've uh, implemented on our Islandora site is uh, access restrictions. 
Restrictions, as everybody knows, hinge on viewing the media, viewing and searching the metadata and downloading the files. So it's really helpful in conversations with people who are donating material to special collections in noting that we can restrict content based on their needs or their comfort levels, especially because a lot of these oral history projects that are happening right now are really current and it's current students. So to this point, all oral history interviewees have allowed us to put the interviews online publicly, but we have restricted download access. This allows people to access it online, but it ensures that anyone who wants to download or reuse it has to kind of contact special collections. So there's a little bit of human follow-up involved in that. We do have a number of access restrictions that allow us to grant granular permissions based on user authentication, which for the most part is uh, just for tri-college authenticated users. So someone who's a member of the Bryn Mawr, Haverford, or Swarthmore community, college community, I should say. <laughs> and we also have uh, school-specific restrictions. So since this is a tool we use as a consortium, sometimes we need to restrict materials to a single school or there are cases where two schools might need access, but not all three. So we can do any combination of that with uh, school-specific restrictions. And I included this screenshot of this interview because you can see we've restricted downloads on this uh, interview. Um, so that was just kind of a brief look at Bryn Mawr's oral histories on Islandora, mainly focused on how it looks. And from here, I'll pass it off to Liz to talk about Haverford. Great. Thanks so much, Jessica. I'm Liz Jones Mensinger. I am the college archivist and records manager at Haverford. And sort of, I uh, was going to do something similar to Jessica here and tell you a little bit about how we are displaying and um, providing access to our oral histories. And you can see that you'll see that we do things a little bit different, as is always the case. The three schools always do things a little bit differently from one another. So Haverford at the moment includes all of its digitized and born digital audiovisual recordings from the college archives in one sort of artificial collection that we're calling the Haverford College Historical Recordings Collection. Some of the items in here are oral histories, but the collection also includes recordings of interviews, speeches, commencement addresses, theatrical performances, and you know other types of recordings, many of which have an accompanying transcript. And the collection includes both audio and video files. So we have a large number of legacy audiovisual recordings dating from, I think the earliest we have are probably the 1940s going up until the 2010s. And a few of these have already had paper copies of transcripts, but the vast majority we didn't have transcripts for. So we also use an outside service that creates transcripts and delivers to them to us as Word documents. We use Scribe. Right now, we primarily use sort of like a, there's an actual person who is doing the transcription, although we're looking into speech recognition transcription as well. So we have sort of this large number of legacy recordings that we're currently digitizing and having transcribed and we'll be adding to Islandora over the next five or so years. We also have an ongoing project where current students interview alumni about their experiences at the college. And uh, right now we're focusing primarily on alumni of color and LGBTQ plus alumni. And uh, these oral history interviews are conducted via Zoom. Uh, this was a, a project that was started during the pandemic and that was sort of the best way to get the project off the ground. And we found that it was the sort of easiest lift in getting students and participants set up. So we've continued doing things via Zoom. And at the moment, we also send those recordings out to the same service that transcribes them. And these recent interviews, in they also have their own separate collection in Islandora, but we share the members of that collection to the Haverford College Historical Recordings Collection as well. And as you know, Jessica said, we are adding transcripts sort of wherever possible to improve accessibility. So most of the objects in this collection consist of a single audio or video file with an associated transcript uh, that's in the form of a text file. But there are a number of instances where we use the compound object model, the content model for some of these, similar to what Jessica said, the student-led interviews, alumni have submitted 
either a photograph or a written reflection that they want to uh, appear alongside their interview recording. But uh, more often, we found that as we're digitizing legacy materials, that a single sort of interview session was recorded on multiple audio reels of varying lengths. And sometimes we don't know how many reels there are until we're very deep in the process. So we've decided to display these as items in a compound object rather than stitching them all together into one file just to sort of preserve the fact that these were on distinct pieces of media originally. So this is a view of a, a three hour recording of a faculty discussion in 1976 that consisted of five audio reels. I believe that's it. And hopefully no other ones will appear from here on out. So um, we also, we like using the compound object content model in cases like this, because we can create and display metadata for the, the set and each individual item. In this case, we can add information on the length of the complete recording, as well as the length of the recording on each reel. And we can give a more general, <clears throat> excuse me, a general overview of the entire recording in the set metadata, and also get more specific in describing what's on each reel in the item metadata. So it gives us some flexibility in that way as well. And for audiovisual recordings using the compound object content model, the transcript text is displayed at the item level, not at the set level. And this is a different media uh, use case from the transcriptions that accompany our paged content model objects, where the transcription tab is displayed next to the parent level metadata um, instead of the, like the page level metadata, which is really minimal. And I think Emily will talk a little bit more about this, but the TRICO has three different terms in our Islandora media use taxonomy to define how different types of transcripts or transcription media objects are used. So since we are adding multiple medias to a single node when we ingest audiovisual recordings or transcripts and transcripts at the same time, we have to sort of make some, do a little bit of configuring for that. We include additional columns in our CSV files with field names that map to media use terms such as transcript or transcript text. Transcript I think is used for the um, sort of timestamped files that Jessica was talking about and transcript text is for the text files. And we also use the additional files configuration option in our YAML file uh, so that Workbench will create a media uh, essentially for each file and assign it to the corresponding media use term. Um, this is an example of something I added to our staging site um, and I've configured it so the additional files are transcript text and included the node ID for transcript text from the Islandora media use taxonomy. And uh, since Howerford is ingesting its transcripts as text files, we have to do some additional configuration here in the YAML file. By default, Workbench maps files with the extension, you know, TXT to the media type extracted text. So if we don't override this, there wouldn't be a transcript tab generated and the transcript text would essentially be treated as an OCR file. So we instead use the media type override option that's in line 16 to tell Workbench to treat text files as files rather than as extracted text. And usually if I'm, you know, just ingesting like one or two, you know, recordings that have a transcript, I might just add them manually, but this is a really nice option when I have say 20 or 30 or more um, recordings that can just override this and make sure the transcripts are also attached. And just wanted to say also many thanks to Mark Jordan for his excellent documentation on media type overrides. That's been incredibly useful. Uh, so I will go ahead and turn things over to Emily. Um, so I'm just going to, when when we were preparing for this presentation, uh, we weren't quite sure exactly who would be in the audience. So I'm going to give an overview of some of the moving parts here that we have configured or that Born Digital has configured for us. And then we kind of have made a couple of tweaks, but there are definitely people in the audience who are much better at explaining how this all works because they actually developed it. So uh, hoping those folks can maybe field some of the questions if there are more technical questions. But this, our, our tab view, our side-by-side -side tabs is configured in the quick tabs module. So this is where we are telling Drupal to show 
different blocks and different um, rendered entities in the tabs themselves. And we have uh, a quick tabs instance for oral histories, as well as the, um, the compound objects that we've also touched on that will show the set description as well as the item level description. We have played around quite a bit with the order of these tabs based on kind of best user experience, but we think that we've got it right now. <laughs> um, as we've touched on, there are a variety of media use terms that map to the things that are rendered in the quick tabs. So transcript text files are called transcript text. Transcript uh, Timed transcript files are called transcripts. And then text transcripts um, that are at the parent level for like book objects are called transcriptions. I really wish we had thought harder about all of this. Born Digital was great and did exactly what we told them that we wanted to do. And now I think that transcript text, transcript and transcription are really, really hard to explain to my student workers. So I thought, I wish we had been a little bit more thoughtful about what we wanna call these various things. Not to say it doesn't work, it totally works. Uh, it's just a little bit confusing <laughs> in the documentation. And then of course, um, we're kind of configuring what um, what types of objects use the oral history quick tabs and and that display mode it has its, uh, it has its own display mode and context to point the repository items towards that display mode once we've ingested them. I think that's all I really want to say about the technical aspects of this because I am the archivist who uses it and not the developers that developed it. But um, in terms of future directions for oral histories, Something that I, I'm interested in doing now that I know kind of how Quick Tabs works a little bit more is to add another tab for technical metadata for um, some of our video and audio files. We have huge, huge, huge grant funded AV digitization efforts at Swarthmore at least that have used PB Core metadata that um, is not really integrated into our um, existing setup. I would like to be able to display some of those really technical um, AV metadata fields in a separate tab that is different from the descriptive metadata that most users are looking for. So that is something that is on the horizon in terms of just like configuring um, what Born Digital has built for us. But I think... At that, we will thank you for letting us show you our site and um, open it up for questions, but also how are you handling oral histories? Because um, we've seen a lot of cool presentations from the community on different ways of handling oral histories. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording at this point and we'll move into the discussion.